Hey, and welcome back to Hazmat Ops Training. My name's Joel. Thank you for being with us again. Uh, this is our first episode in a series on railroad incidents. We've got a lot of information for you. Be sure and stay with us. In today's episode, we're not really going to talk about uh, rail cars, we're not going to talk about locomotives, that kind of thing. We want to focus today on general safety around the rail. Uh, there's a lot of things that are cause us trouble out here. As with any workplace, slip strips and falls are going to cause us the most problems. So we're going to talk about some of those things, some of the things that can, can cause us some issues out here, uh, some of the safety issues that we may run into. First thing I'd like to talk about is pre-planning uh, your rail incidents. Uh, if you have railroad in your uh, response territory, make sure that you're familiar uh, with your, your carriers. Make sure that you pre-plan your areas. Find your vulnerable areas. Uh, there's a lot of vulnerability on the rail, especially for things that cross the rail. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're very familiar with what's in our territory uh, so that we're not taken by surprise. I've got a link in the description to the major rail carriers in the United States. Uh, I, as you know, I'm in North Carolina. It's a beautiful uh, North Carolina morning. Uh, but we uh, have CSX and Norfolk Southern primarily here in North Carolina uh, and in the Southeast. Uh, but I, again, I've got that uh, link there for you uh, for all the major rail carriers in the United States. Your 911 centers should have that information, but we want to make sure uh, that we're also carrying that on the rig, uh, make sure that we've also got that information readily available to us as responders. There may be times when it's more efficient uh, to speak to that carrier's dispatch center direct. Uh, there may be some information where the, they may want to get in touch with us direct. So it's a good idea to have that information readily available. You see here that at your crossings, You'll have the contact information, you'll have the mile marker information. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're familiar with that. I got a couple of, of different uh, examples here that you may see. You want to talk specifically here for just a second about those notifications. Uh, there's nothing wrong with you as an incident commander uh, there on the ground of an incident, uh, double checking with the rail uh, carrier uh, to make sure that those lines have been uh, shut down, make sure that everything's closed, make sure the area that you're working in is, is quote unquote locked out. Our dispatch centers do a great job, but there's nothing wrong with confirming that for yourself. Big thing there as well, if you don't have that pre-planned emergency response telephone number information, it's right there on the, on the placard there at the crossing. And that goes for any rail incident, not just a derailment, not just a, where maybe a vehicle's been hit at, at a, a crossing like this. Uh, anything, a medical emergency near the rail, um, some sort of other emergency, maybe even in, a, you know, in an industrial area. Uh, you see like where I am here, it may be an industrial area where there's an incident taking place near the rail. Um, anytime that you're, you're working in and around the rail, uh, we want to make sure that we have those notifications made. And as you can see here, we talked about two active lines. We always want to make sure that we're very aware of multiple lines that we may have uh, on the, the rail because uh, we said this was a siding here, but we may have two active lines and they may be used by multiple carriers. Uh, so it's very, very important that we're aware that we may have traffic in two different directions uh, and they may be from two different carriers. So it's, it's important to have those conversations uh, with your dispatchers and also to confirm with the railway dispatchers that they're uh, fully uh, aware of any multiple traffic that could be, could be on the rail. In the later episodes, we'll talk about uh, locomotives, we'll talk about different types of, of rail cars, those that carry hazardous materials, those that carry other things. But it's important never ever climb on or under, on top of anything, on, on any type of rail equipment, uh, unless you're accompanied by uh, someone from the railway uh, and they're advising you on, on what they need you to do, what assistance they need. Remember, we're ops level responders. Uh, there's very little uh, in the way of offensive type measures that we need to be doing. We wanna be focused on 
making sure that we're recognizing and identifying hazardous materials issues. Uh, and then we want to, to look especially at our rescue situations, our life safety situations, but we want to stay in our lane. We want to stay in our scope of practice as ops level responders. Uh, so again, stay off that equipment uh, unless it's in, within your scope of practice and you're being advised by the rail. You're on their property, uh, you're on their equipment, so you want those subject matter experts advising you on what they need you to do. So let's talk about a little bit of the characteristics of the, the rail itself. Uh, what you see here, this, this rocky surface, uh, this base, if you will, uh, for the rail is known as the ballast. Uh, this particular area here, we've got a lot of working room. Uh, if we had to, to uh, work a, around a derailment or around a situation, uh, potentially where uh, a vehicle's been struck or something like that um, at a crossing like what you see up there, I'll zoom in just a little closer to the cross and we'll walk back up there and look at some of those things in a few minutes. But again, this is the ballast. You can see uh, that we have this, uh, this heavy rock uh, in and of itself creates a problem with, with uh, footing. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're, we're being real careful around that ballast. Remember, a lot of times we're gonna be out here at night. Uh, there are no lights, no street lights, no nothing. Uh, that will light up our rail. So think about the hazards that exist already. Again, uh, bigger rocks here, uh, footing is gonna be a problem, but also in the dark, it just compounds the problem, makes it a lot, uh, lot more intense. So we'll step up here on the rail. Uh, you can see that this is a, this is a branch line uh, that uh, gets used quite often. Uh, this is not a main line, it is a branch line which means that it goes from basically kind of from city to city. Uh, this, this rail gets used a lot and you can see there that the rail uh, it's not as polished as a main line would be, uh, but it is uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, well used. You can see that's pretty obvious there uh, by, the, by the shiny rail. What we want to do here as well is, if, especially if we're walking around a car, or if we're walking up and down the rail uh, looking for a problem, uh, we may, again, we may have had a vehicle struck there uh, at the crossing and it may have pushed the vehicle all the way down here. Uh, whatever the case may be, there's a hundred different scenarios that we could talk about there. Uh, but our natural tendency a lot of times when we're uh, working on the rail or working on anything that we step over, uh, it, the tendency oftentimes is to step on the obstruction. And that's, that's, we don't want to do that. Uh, we, you can see how polished that rail is. We want to have kind of a habit uh, in mind for stepping over that rail. Uh, here's the other thing. We don't want to step over or, and cross that rail if we don't have to. That's only if absolutely necessary. We want to try to resist the temptation uh, to, to cross the rail at all. But again, be very, very careful uh, not to step on the rail because again, most of the time we're gonna be in protective gear. Uh, we may be in, in uh, boots and things like that, especially uh, rubber bottom boots. They get extremely uh, slick when you come in contact with a metal surface like that. And you can see as, as polished as it is, uh, there's a high likelihood that we're gonna slip uh, on that if, if we've got any moisture on our, uh, on our boots or, or our shoes at all. We also want to make sure that we don't stand between the rails. That's a no-no as well. Uh, there's no reason to be there, especially again, if you have a, a working area out here, we want to keep our personnel uh, from between those rails. There's just so many things that can cause us problems. If at all possible, we want to try to cross uh, at, a, at, a, at a, uh, a, a regular crossing uh, where there's uh, better footing, uh, better surface, as a general rule, we wanna to try to stay at least 25 feet off the rail. And you can see here where I'm standing, I can't really get, it's hard for me to get, even with as much area as we have beside the rail, I'm about 25 feet from the rail now. So that's, that's really kind of a good rule of thumb uh, to stay off, especially if there's gonna be active traffic. We'll look here real quick at, uh, at this line. We have a single line that comes in, and just before this crossing, it comes into two. You'll see that it splits right here. Uh, so the left-hand side 
is going to a, uh, a siding uh, that goes into a manufacturing facility up the, up the rail there. But what we want to look at here quickly is the switching uh, gear that we have. I'm going to zoom, I'll zoom out just in just a few minutes. We'll have switching gear uh, that basically takes that uh, one rail into two and we can manipulate where the, uh, where the train goes. But anywhere we have these, these switching um, gear and switching parts and things like that, that's a place for uh, boots to get caught. That's a place for, uh, you know, us to trip. It creates a lot of other obstructions. So we wanna make sure that we're being extremely careful. It's very tempting to pull our apparatus right up uh, next to the rail. Um, and in a lot of cases, that, that's, that's possible for us to do, but that's called fouling the track. Um, and you see here, I've got an example uh, of, a, of a law enforcement vehicle uh, that would definitely be fouling. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're outside and, be, and make sure that we're aware uh, that the train equipment hangs well off of just the rail footprint. Another thing we wanna mention quickly is how difficult it is to judge distance. Down around that curve is about a thousand feet. I know it doesn't look like it. Uh, that's somewhere 800 to a thousand feet um, as far as we can see around there. It straightens out and um, there's about another thousand feet uh, to the next uh, crossing down there. Uh, so that's uh, something that we really want to take into consideration how difficult it is to judge distance and also if there's a locomotive coming at us how difficult it is to judge speed uh, oftentimes uh, if we have cars that are on the rail uh, that have been involved in a derailment they may be loose uh, they may have have come loose from the the train itself and they may be just creeping down the track and we don't realize it it's, it's extremely hard in some cases too to, to be able to tell if a car is even moving uh, so again, just take that into consideration and remember that working around the rail. We talked about the, the next crossing in either direction. So if we've got problems uh, here on the rail, and let's say we, we may be in this area, um, we're working on getting the train traffic stopped, we want to make sure that we send someone uh, you know, down, down the rail this way uh, to the next uh, crossing and potentially maybe even two or three crossings up depending on the distance. Uh, it's important to remember that a loaded freight train, the average size and length of loaded freight train, and that's, you know, that's, that's a broad term, uh, but it, it'll take at least a mile to stop that train. So again, I told you in this direction, it's only about uh, a half a mile maybe just a little under a half a mile to the next crossing. So if we had a lookout in that direction and we've got a train, average size train, uh, running at rated speed on the rail, they're not gonna get stopped before they get to us right here. So we would need to go a couple of, of crossings up uh, to warn that engineer uh, that there's, uh, the, the track is obstructed, the track is fouled. If at all possible, we want to try not to put fire hose across the rail. Again, if we have a, a train that comes along before we're able to make the notifications to get traffic stopped, um, our, our hoses don't stand a chance uh, coming across there. Uh, it is possible to dig out the ballast. Uh, that's very labor intensive. Uh, the, the, uh, the better option would be to try to get access on both sides um, and be able to, to run your, your hose down. Now again, you may have problems with access uh, in general, our problem may be, again, it may be 800 to 1,000 feet down uh, from the crossing, it may be between two crossings, and it, it could be miles and miles between crossings. Uh, so again, access is gonna be a big problem for us, but we wanna try to keep all of our obstructions off the rail at all possible. Again, this is our first episode in our rail series. Uh, so make sure you tune in uh, as we work on those and as we post those uh, in the weeks to come. Uh, we've enjoyed you being here. Hope you got something out of it. Make sure you like and subscribe. If you found us by way of our Facebook group, uh, it's also called Hazmat Ops Training. So make sure that you, you join us there. Hey, thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time.